Okay, hi everybody. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Good. Everyone have a nice summer? <laughs> no? Why not? <laughs> oh, and I guess here we can start with text. We actually have no season, so it's summer never actually begins and ends. Uh, my name is Josh Blackman. I'll be your prof professor this uh, term. I'm very grateful to all of you in my class. Uh, everyone was able to find the syllabus okay? Everyone knew what to do? All right, let's, let's start off. And actually, this is coming to tradition. I have food for you. I swear, it's not a bribe. The first day of class last year was my birthday, and I brought cookies, and the students were very happy. So it's not my birthday this week. I missed it by about a week. But uh, please pass me around. We have anonymous cookies. I want to know who eats who doesn't. Please just finish them off, because I have three boxes in the other class, three for this class. So, funny. OK. Now that I've distracted you sufficiently. Uh, I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about my expectations for this class. Um, I always want to put you guys in the right frame of mind. So you're already taking property one. And I think what you're going to find, perhaps some surprising, is how little property two has to do with property one. There's very little in common. And the biggest gap is in property one, everything was between two private landowners. You know, I want to leave land to my son, or person A sells to person B. In this class, with very limited exceptions, talking about the individual versus the government, where the government tries saying, here's how you use your land. Here's how you zone your land. Here's how you can build. Here's a mortgage that you can use. So it's a slightly different focus. But to take a, a bigger perspective, it still has a lot of vagaries. Unlike torts, which has a restatement, contracts, which has you know, the UCC, uh, civil procedure, which has the federal procedure, or criminal law, which has the model penal code, there is no one good property. There is really no black letter property law. You know this from last year. There isn't one. I had the same lecture with the one else this morning. There isn't going to be a good black letter. And that's frustrating to a lot of students, and it's frustrating to everyone, because like, what's the law? What's the law? And there isn't really a good answer for what the law is. What we try and do in this class is give you a number of cases that represent a wide range of uh, uh, majority and minority views, and try to learn the principles, and you can help yourself out. We're applicable. I will show you the Texas law like I do today. We do the adverse possession statute. But by and large, there's going to be a lot of stuff you're going to learn in this class. Okay, so let's just take a, a quick run through the syllabus. And uh, just this will give you a good overview of what we're going to do. Uh, the first two classes are just adverse possession. This doesn't really fit anywhere. Um, and it probably should be taught with property one. You didn't, did you, you didn't cover it, right? Yeah, I, I don't know why it's stuck here, but that's what the school does, so that's how I continue it. Um, but so these two classes, I do at the beginning because they just they just don't fit anywhere. But uh, there, there's a pretty easy way to start off because the topic's not that hard conceptually. The next big unit of class focuses on selling property. Uh, if you think about it, every single case you did last year involved giving property to someone after they died or when something happened. It never happened, oh, hey, let me sell this to you. You didn't really do that. It was always, here, I'm going to give this to my great-grandchildren in 100 years. So we actually talk about how do you sell property. This is a little bit more mechanical. I think some people like this class more because it actually has some semblance to reality. So we talk about the contract of sale, uh, there are various dues to disclose, implied warranties, um, the various deeds to how to deliver it, how to actually sell it. Uh, then we turn to mortgages, which, uh, how many of you are homeowners? Oh, I love it. See, this is why I love teaching the evening students, because in the day class, no one ever has a house. I don't. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I do appreciate that. So many of you have taken mortgages. will be very um, helpful. And people have taken mortgages, have done title searches, or at least know what that is. We'll talk about how to ascertain who actually owns what. And this is uh, all part of the first, maybe not quite half, maybe 40% of the semester. How do you buy a piece of property? That's the first half. The second half turns to what we can broadly call land use, right? How it is that private parties and the government manages the use of land. So we start with talking about nuisances. And a nuisance is just something that bothers you, a smell or a vibration or sunlight, something that bothers people. Then we talk about easements. Um, I don't want to define too much, but easement basically says, hey, I have a piece of property. If you pay me, I'll let you do something to it. I'll let you cross my land. Like, for example, the case we have today, the Von Valkenburg case. He was saying, I want an easement. I want to be able to walk across your land to get to the main road. That's all an easement is. Uh, a 
Covenants are similar. They say you can or can't do something with your land. So these are the private mechanisms by which people enforce what someone else can do with their land. If someone's using their land in a dangerous way, you say, okay, don't do this, and I'll pay you for it. Or do this, and I'll pay you for it. Or do this, and you'll let me do something to your land. It's all about private people finding ways to use your lands more efficiently. Then we turn to the final, maybe, maybe it's a quarter of the semester, which talks about government land use. We talk about zoning. How is it that the government can decide where you can build, what you can build, and what it looks like? This is an interesting wrinkle because in Houston we have no zoning, and I, I will do an entire class on the fact that Houston has no zoning, but they actually do. We just don't tell anyone about it. From there we go into what's called taking. This is where the government does exactly that. They take your property. Um, when the government wants to use your property, they have to pay you for it. That's usually not the hard part. The hard part is deciding have they actually taken your property. It's a very tricky question. And we wind up the semester with uh, a lecture on eminent domain where not only do they do something to your property, they actually take your home and bulldoze it. So that's kind of a fitting conclusion. So that provides a good overview of everything. And this, this will, I think, be a little bit more of a useful class than property one because this is what most people do. They do land use, they might do mortgages, they might do sales. Okay. Now, you're going to learn a lot in this class. I, I love teaching. This is something I'm really passionate about. I'm going to give you a lot of knowledge. Um, and these aren't just going to be just blank rules, which I want you to memorize. I want you to get this and understand this, because there isn't a black letter answer to a lot of these questions. A lot of this is going to be depends. And, and understanding the various tools in your toolkit that you can use to persuade people is going to be important. We're going to talk a lot about things like fairness which you might think is just gibberish, but a lot of what judges do actually involve the equities. There's actually a subject with law called equities. You, you have to figure out how to weigh things. We'll talk a lot about efficiency. Uh, you can maybe describe it in terms of economics, but let's just keep it in terms of efficiency. Courts like to do things that are efficient. They like to structure transactions in a way that are easy to resolve. And if your client has an argument, maybe they lose in fairness, well, maybe they can do better with efficiency. So we'll talk a lot about economics in that as well. Uh, a theory often gets a really bad rap. You say, well, why do I need to learn theory? What, what, what's the point of this? Well, when you're making an argument where your case is not resolved by the black letter law, you need to turn to something else. And invariably, you're going to turn to some sort of argument. And this argument is going to be based on some sort of theory, saying, Your Honor, you know, the law might not be clearly on this side, but here's some other things that might weigh in favor. So these are different things which you should learn and, and just kind of embrace and internalize, which I, th I think you will. And also, property at times can be uh, something of a dry class. And I, I do my best to try to make it interesting. I, I always have pictures. I'm a very visual and graphic learner. Um, some people are, some people aren't. But I always try to have pictures of the people and maps and, and various videos. Um, and this kind of helps to uh, put the class in context. Because um, when you study cases of this, of this, you know, this thick red book, uh, it's dehumanized. And so we're just reading about these people who don't really care. But we should always remember that uh, at its heart, law is about people. These are people who had problems. Every single person in that book had a problem. Either they did something wrong, or something did something wrong to them. If there was no problem, they wouldn't be in the book. People screw up and go to lawyers because they have problems. And that's something which we, we lose sight of all too often. So we're going to try and get a very big holistic approach. Okay. Uh, the, let me talk a little about the, uh, the class. So my mode of recitation might be a little bit different than other classes. Um, my goal is to make this entire class into a discussion. I don't like to lecture. This is probably the longest I will talk the entire semester. Uh, so if you don't like my voice, it'll be good for you. Um, I try to get everyone involved. We have roughly about 60 kids in this class. Okay? In a given class, I might call on maybe most of you, maybe 40. What I do is I start at a given point. I don't know where. I usually find a random point in the class. And I go up and down the rows, up and down the rows, each way. Each person gets roughly one question, maybe two questions if it's an easy question. So as you go up and down the row, when I call on your neighbor, that's your hint that you're next. Um, sometimes people on the ends get screwed because I don't always jump around the same way. Uh, but I'll try, I'll try to keep it as consistent as I can. I'll, I'll try to always f follow the same kind of snaky pattern, but sometimes I forget. The reason why I do this is because I want each and every one of you to feel involved in this class. Um, last semester I had 85, which is either a lot, a lot more than this class. I want you to feel that you're actually being engaged. And by calling on one person after another, it becomes a sustained conversation. In my mind, I'm not speaking to, you know, 
85 individual students. I'm speaking to one class, and I just look to a different person to continue the conversation. Um, this is going to be tough for you because you have to keep on the ball. You have to figure where the class is going. Uh, you can't just kind of slouch in your chair and say, oh, I hope he doesn't call me today because odds are I will snake my way to you at some point in the class. But the other side to, to kind of a con of this approach is that if you don't know the answer, I'm not going to sit there and dwell on you for five minutes. Now, there's a good and bad to that. Um, you might say the good is, yes, I can sneak away without knowing the answer, uh, but that's only short-lived. Um, if I call on you, you don't know the answer, I'm going to try and push you a little bit. If you really don't know, I'll move on, but I will come back to you, probably with something tougher later. Um, and invariably, there's something in the class that didn't require that you do the reading, but if you're paying attention in class, it's something you could figure out, and I'll probably hit you with that, and you don't know when it's coming. So try to be prepared. Um, again, I'm not going to yell at you. You're all adults. Um, you will soon be in a profession that's self-regulated. When you go hire a client and you go to a judge, no one's going to check if you did your homework. If you didn't, you're going to embarrass yourself. So just, just be responsible. Um, the readings are manageable. Um, uh, and I, by the way, I was actually an evening student in my first year of law school, so I have a very strong empathy for all of you. I know you have jobs and you have families. So uh, the readings are very manageable. No more than 25, sometimes 30 pages uh, for, for a class. Um, I try not to do more than three cases a day. So I try and keep everything doable. It's not easy, but you're in law school. But I try to make it as manageable as possible. Um, I always start class on time. I'm not going to keep you late. Um, this syllabus, as it is now, is, is the final one. Um, I've been teaching this class a couple times now. I've not once deviated. I'm very good at keeping on pace. If I say we'll do these 25 pages on Tuesday, we'll do those. Next class, we'll do those. So you can budget your schedule on the weekends. I know you like to do your work on the weekends. Budget your schedule as you see fit. You can now see from now till November what you're going to have to do. Uh, you have you know, your legal writing projects, everything else. You can, you can negotiate all these deadlines along the way. Okay? Uh, okay. Um, I won't be using Stanley this term. Uh, this is the course blog. The easy way to get there, if you forget, just go to joshblackman.com. It's my name. And there's a link for classes. If you click that classes link, there'll be a list of classes in your property too. Excuse me, fall 2013. Um, there are a number of things on here. Uh, easiest is just click for the syllabus. Uh, if you want to email me, you're free to use my South Texas email, but that will get to me quicker. Uh, it's just it's prop two, fall 23, and it's Josh Blackman. I have, a, I have a filter, so if something comes from there, it flags me right away, so I'm not to disregard it. I will. I'm very good with email. If you email me, I usually respond like in a day or so. Uh, so if you have questions, feel free. Um, also, my office hours. So I know with you guys, it's always tough office hours. So what I will do to make it easier is immediately after class, if you want to come talk to me? So you have a break for your next class, I think? 15 minutes? All right, so I'll be here the 15 minutes before class, and if you want, I'm in room 623, just one floor up. Get here a little early, come talk to me. Um, I know it's often tough for you to get out of work, so email me and I'll find a way to talk to you, but I want to make sure that you find time to talk to me. I know, I know you don't have a lot of time at school because you're always running around, but we'll, we'll, we'll find the time. And I know email's good for some of you, so just, just fire away. Uh, I'd ask that you check this class every day when we have, I'm sorry, if you check this page every day when we have class, uh, it'll take you a minute. Uh, I usually update around 6 a.m., um, so if you check it any time after that, you'll see. Um, if you're so inclined, there's a Twitter feed, there's a Facebook feed, and there's also an RSS feed. You can follow that if you wish, or you can just do it. Uh, you can also enter your email address here, and I'll send you a daily update of the pages, but it will probably only email you after the class is over, so it's not, it's more of a helpful after the fact than before the fact. Um, just check it every day we have class. Uh, I, I probably, I, I don't usually email the entire class. I find those blasts not too helpful because people usually disregard them. So um, if there is something urgent, I will email you, but for the most part, anything you'll need will be right here. So on this page, in addition to this kind of preliminary information, we have uh, the class blog post for the day. And again, I'll post one of these each day at roughly 6 a.m., uh, give or take. There are a couple of things to, uh, that I want to highlight. So the first thing is here it says the lecture notes. Uh, I am actually have it up right here. Oh, some of you already clicked on it. These lecture notes are what I keep in class to kind of uh, bring the discussion along. Um, I don't use PowerPoint, and the reason why is PowerPoints are very structured. 
uh, I like for the class to dictate where I go. And if I see the class is maybe focusing on one thing or maybe it doesn't understand something else, I change it up on the fly. I don't really have a set path. I mean, last year I taught the same class twice, and every class was twice in one day. And both classes were totally different. So I want you to push me to where you want to go. So these are just a way for me to jot down some quick notes. Um, these aren't a substitute for your own notes. Uh, they're not going to be very good for reviewing for exams. Trust me, they're not going to be very good. They'll give you random words that might make sense in class, but won't make sense afterwards. Um, these should be a substitute for your own uh, record keeping. Do that yourself. Okay? So th those are those. And these will be on the board. So even if you don't have a computer, you don't need it. You can just look right up there. And all these little cute icons, those mean that people are clicking onto it, so now you're paying attention. Uh, the other thing uh, that I have open is called a, a live chat. And, and this is part of my effort to keep the class very uh, democratic. I want to hear from you. And invariably, when I'm going up and down the rows, I'm speaking at one person per time. Someone else might have a question, comment, or thought. I'd like for you to put it up here. It's real easy. You just click on the link. Each day there'll be a different one. You put your name. Uh, I, I'd ask you to just use your first name and last initial or something. Um, this, this keeps the uh, discourse at a, at a good level because when people start giving fake names, it gets... Uh... <laughs> See, I personally, it doesn't bother me, but, but, but some, some people find it annoying. So I found that if I keep people with their real names, it, 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 it stays cool. So you type something there, and it says whatever. I, I see this on the board. So whatever you type will pop up right there, and I can address it. Um, if there's a link you might want to share or a story you might want to share, uh, do it. It's, it's just a way to keep everyone engaged in the conversation, especially if you're you know, raising your hand and I can't call on you, because invariably that will happen. Okay. Uh, I also record all the lectures. Um, I'm actually recording as we speak. Um, hi. So... One note about that, this is not a substitute for coming to class. It absolutely is not, for one really practical reason. This microphone will not pick up student answers. It just won't. If you listen to the recordings, you'll hear my voice loud and clear, and then silence whenever I ask a question. So you're not going to hear the answers on the video. There's Technically, I can't do anything about it. And unless all of you hold a microphone or scream, it won't get on here. Um, I actually got a complaint last year. Someone said, well, I can't hear the students on YouTube. It's like, I, I can't do anything. So this is not a substitute. This is meant if you miss class or you can't come or you're sick or work or something, watch this and just get your notes from your, from your classmates. Because that way you can at least piece together what I said and roughly what a student said. Okay, so this is not a substitute. Also, I have statistics on this. Uh, and I can check how, how much people are actually watching. I don't know who's watching, but I know how much people are watching. And very rarely does anyone actually watch the entire 90-minute video. So all these kids staying at home saying, oh, I'll watch the video. So they're not. Uh, I know they're not. They're only watching part of it. Usually the first 15 minutes have a lot of people, and then it kind of trickles down. <laughs> so this is just meant for your convenience. Um, a couple students said that before an exam, what they would just do is they watch the first and last minutes of each class when I kind of summarize stuff. That's a good way of doing it. Um, but it's not a substitute for class. OK? I think, I think that's it. Any? Oh, not not for the class, but about the introductory stuff. Um, I, I I take this very seriously. I want you all to learn a lot. I want this to be fun. Law school is a stressful, hectic time of your lives. You're all under a lot of pressure. Um, I don't want this class to exacerbate that. I want this to just be a way to learn, enjoy yourself, uh, build relations with your classmates, especially even since you you're all in the same class one after another. I suspect. So um, this is just a way to kind of relax and to uh, enjoy as much as you can. And I think, I think you'll like the class. Any questions before we start? OK. All right, let me pass this around. And, and I actually drew the arrow this time. Just make sure that your name is right side up this way. Oh, you're, you're laughing. Last year, I had to redo the entire chart because everyone wrote the name upside down. Because <laughs> when the first person doesn't do it. Um, just as a matter of course, I, I try to use people's first names. You can call me Josh. Um, unless you're working for a judge or in the government somewhere, you'll probably call all of your supervisors by their first names. Uh, usually judge and military and some government jobs are the exception. So feel free to call me Josh. I know you won't. Uh, no one ever does. But you're welcome to. Um, and I'll call you by your first name. And uh, I'll do my best to, to learn them. It's 
it is tricky. I do have your pictures, and they do put the pictures in the, on the map, which makes it a little bit easier, but it might take me. So for today, for the first day of class, um, I'm, if I call on you, just, just repeat your name and say your name, and uh, that way I'll hopefully internalize it. Okay? All right. Any questions? All right. Let's watch a movie. I do have yes, sir. Um, there's something about like having the final open book. Yeah, the final open book. Something weird about. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's that working? <clears throat> Let me put it this way: it won't help you. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's right. It's not going to help you. Um, <laughs> If you're sitting on, and I'll, I mean, I'll talk about the exam at a lot more in a, uh, in a couple weeks. Don't want to scare you the first day, but if you're sifting through your notes on the first day, you're doing it wrong. I mean, if you if you have three hours and you're looking through your notes, you're doing it really wrong. Um, you can talk to people who took this last year. The notes aren't going to help you. Um, and if you're so indulged, uh, I have all my exams from last year, so I think you have a total of like five or six total questions, which you're free to do right there on the website. You can click around and review them. The notes won't help you. Um, the reason why I mention up front is that, you know, I once had a professor who told us the first day of law school, everything's open book, and I was taking really good notes. You know, I was making my outlines throughout the way. Then he says, oh, yeah, by the way, it's closed book. And I was really mad because I made all my notes ready for the exam. I couldn't bring them. So I tell you this up front. Make your notes. Make your outlines. Make things in, a, in an organized way, and you can use it for the exam, and it won't help you. I mean, it, it won't. I mean, unless you have a super duper outline and you know it by heart, but this is going to be something you just have to think a lot. This is not something, the exam is not going to be black letter multiple choice questions. It's going to be something that makes you really think. But I, I promise to talk much more about that later. Okay, any other questions? All right, I hope you can hear this. Okay. Okay. What if you could. Oh, by the way, anyone here from Dallas? Flower Mound, do you know where that is? Okay. So I'll give a little bit of a setup. So we're doing adverse possession today. This is a video from maybe two years ago. Each year I do this, the video gets older. Uh, but the video is from two years ago uh, and involves uh, a, a fairly wealthy suburb of Dallas, Flower Mound. It's a good neighborhood, right? Okay. So it's a fairly wealthy suburb of, of Dallas called Flower Mound. Okay. And just watch the video. If you can't hear it, uh, I'll, I'll just. Not very loud. Live in a new home without a mortgage. A man in Flower Mound has done it, moved into a $300,000 house, and he only paid $16 to do it. It's a little known Texas law, and the, the foreclosure mess could have him living on Easy Street, but his neighbors, well, they're less than thrilled. Channel A's Casey Norton has this exclusive from Flower Mound. Flower Mound's Waterford Drive is lined with well manicured $300,000 homes. So when a new neighbor moved in without the usual sale, mortgage-paying homeowners had a few questions. What paperwork is it, and how is it legally binding if he doesn't legally own the house? He just squats there. Lee Lowry and her husband told me the house down the street was in foreclosure for more than a year. Hmm. Go on, YouTube. Let's go. This is actually not as bad. The owner walked away, then the mortgage company went out of business. Apparently, that opened the door for someone to take advantage of the situation. <laughs> Kenneth Robinson told us he's no squatter. He says he moved in on June 17th after months of research about a Texas law called adverse possession. This is uh, not a normal process, uh, but it's not a process that's not known. It's just not known to everybody. Robinson says this piece of paper gives him rights to the house. It's an online form he printed out and filed at the Denton County Courthouse for $16. It says the house was abandoned and he's claiming ownership. I went through, looked at it, and added some things here, you know what I mean, for my own protection. The house is virtually empty, just a few pieces of furniture, no running water or electricity. But Robinson says just by setting up camp in the living room, Texas law gives him exclusive negotiating rights with the original owner. If the owner wants him out, he would have to pay off his massive mortgage debt, and the bank would have to file a complicated lawsuit. Robinson believes neither is likely. So if he stays in the house, after three years, he can ask the court for the title. And that's your goal, eventually, is to have title of this home, to be the owner of this house. And, uh, I don't know, Rick, you know, at this point, you know, since I possess it, I don't know. 
Robinson posted no trespassing signs after neighbors asked police to arrest him for breaking in. But Flower Mound officers say they can't remove him from the property because home ownership is a civil matter, not criminal. Lowry and her neighbors continue to look for legal ways to get him out. Or if he wants the house, buy the house like everyone else had to. Get the money, buy the house. Robinson says he's not buying anything. As far as he's concerned, the $330,000 home is already his, and he has the paperwork to prove it. Casey Norton, Channel 8 News. Now, foreclosures are down for the sixth month in a row in North Texas. August filings fell 14% compared to last year. However, something to keep in perspective. Foreclosures are still 313% higher than in August of 2000. All right. Can everyone hear that? I apologize. It's kind of low. So, everyone hear it more or less? So, so the gist is, house in Flower Mound, you know, affluent suburb up to Dallas, went to foreclosure. No one was living there. Mr. Robinson read up in his property books. He set up camp. He went to the courthouse and filed this document. Hold on. This, this isn't the actual one he used, but this is effectively, pretend that says Mr. Robinson. But he filed this document in court. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, what's your name? Melinda. Melinda or Belinda? Belinda. All right, so you're from Dallas. What do you think of this case? So this is before you went to law school, right? And then as a non-lawyer, what were you thinking when you first heard this story? No way. No way. No way. <laughs> and, and now, I guess two and a half years later, You've done the reading for the first day of class. What do you think? Okay. Ma'am, ma what's your name? Benicia. Benicia, what do, what do you think? Before you went to law school, what would you have thought if you heard this story? Yeah, that it just doesn't seem like it. How can you steal this house, right? right. And, and now what do you think after doing 15 pages of reading on the topic? Three years is a little short. Okay, let's let's take a sh let's take a show of hands. Okay, raise your hand if you think that this is crazy. That there's no way that Mr. Robinson should get this house for just sitting it for three years. Raise your hand. Okay, maybe half. Okay, raise your hand if you think that this is the law. And if he sits there for three years, then he should be able to keep the house. Yeah, a little bit more than half. Okay. Uh, let's jump down here. Which way did you vote, sir? What was your name? Oh, well, oh, good. Even better. What's your name? Luke. Luke, why didn't you vote? Because I don't think the way he is possessing the house really falls in hand. Why not? Because he is he's operating, well, he's operating in bad faith. But he also, instead of possessing it in in due course of like owning continuous property. He out he went out and just squatted, I guess. I don't know. I don't know that that has any bearing. What do you think? What's your name? Alex. Alex, what do you think? To kind of pick up on the same point. I think it mentioned in the video that he not he doesn't have electricity. He doesn't nope. have anything that he nope. So he's not actively owning the home. He like he's essentially just squatting it, which some sort of improvement. I'm I'm sure he, Looked like the Arbus mode. I mean, looked like he put up trespassing there. signs. Yeah, he put up trespassing <laughs> keeping, signs. He's keeping he it safe. Establish some kind of living situation. So I mean, I don't know. It's, I don't know either way, but yeah. What's the service here? Adam. Adam, what do you think? In the long the law, but still, it's, it's tough to swallow. All right. So this this case was, uh, I think, this this video is, I think, July 2011. So over two years away. Who here thinks that Mr. Robertson's still in the house, chilling, waiting for another year? Okay. Who here thinks that Bank of America foreclosed in him at a week and evicted him like a week later? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this didn't last long. So, I mean, we study that in, in you know, property law, the requirements be open and notorious. We'll get there in a minute. But he was way too notorious. He made such a big deal about this that I think within two or three weeks, Bank of America kicked him out. Um, he was saying, oh, they have to file a complicated lawsuit. Okay, it's called an action ejectment. And it probably took their corporate lawyer 15 minutes to file. So, it wasn't a big deal, but but that's yeah. Here we go. Okay, what's the date on this? Uh, oh, January. So it actually, took him a couple months. So it took him about roughly five months. Uh, <laughs> he faces the eviction notice. Um, 
Yeah. Court papers, Bank of America says it now owns a property in question. It's asking for to be evicted. And I, th I think he was evicted in, in, in due time. We'll talk about eviction uh, uh, a little bit later in the semester. But this was the risk Mr. Robinson took, right? He was sitting in there. He said, well, I'm not the owner. I'm the owner of record. Being an adverse possessor is not a fun game because you can be kicked out at any time. The reason why we have the adverse possession statute, as perverse as it sounds, is after three years, we've got to give Mr. Robinson some, some comfort. Right? Because after three years, he knows that he's safe, that the house is now his. Uh, so what's your name? Brett. Brett, do you think adverse possession can be should be characterized as a form of theft? certainly see why somebody would. Well, what do you that. think? Um, I think it all goes back to the using it, you know, using land as best use. I mean, that's kind of how all the property was, you know, founded in this country. And I think that if it's going to sit there and it's not going to be used, and somebody oh. takes it and uses it, he's using it. He's sitting there. He has his, he has that little folding chair. I have the same folding chair with a cup holders. Really, he's not really doing anything to improve the land. It's not. Well, I mean, he's a flower mound. I mean, it's not like a farm. But what's he going to do to improve? Most of the people that live in that area are contributing to society because. They do have the money to afford this Contributing house. how? Uh, with jobs, with uh, sending their kids to the schools in the area, they're um, paying taxes. Ah, ah. Does adverse for possession require that you pay property taxes? I'm assuming fly around as property taxes? I'm guessing, yeah. Yeah, I'm guessing, yeah. Good, good guess. <laughs> it would depend on, I guess, the area you're in. Okay. So, what's your name? Jennifer? So, is the threshold first? Improving the land nowadays, just paying taxes on it? Mm -hmm. What is it? What do you think? Is this theft? Is this just uh, giving someone the ability to uh, swoop in and take this beautiful, gorgeous house in, in this nice neighborhood? Oh, that house is huge. I don't think it's theft. Because, like you said, the bank easily kicked them out. And if they were going to just let them stay there for three years and not do anything with mm -hmm. it, yeah. it well, so they're going to Down here, what's your name? Ross. Ross. Is the bank to blame here? I mean, the video didn't say, but I think the house was vacant for some time. And I'm sure a lot of you know in neighborhoods around Texas, you have houses that are just empty, one after another, because they can't be sold. They were basically underwater. I mean, is the bank at fault here? Well, I mean, so there's nothing they can do with foreclosure. Well, they put a padlock. <clears throat> or did they put a padlock? See, what's not clear here, and I actually I don't know the answer, is did he break in? Um, if you, uh, so what's your name? Josh. Oh, oh pleasure. If, if yeah, I, I knew that. <laughs> I know this guy. It's just uh, if he did break in, does that make a difference? Uh, well, if he broke in, that would be a criminal matter. But uh, as far as the title of the property, it's yeah. silent. Most people who adversely possess property have to break in in the first place. If you think about it, for the first three years, Mr. Robinson's a criminal. He is. There's no. Doubt about it. He broke into someone else's property. He has this little piece of paper, which I'll, I'll come back to later. Pretend his name's there, but he has this little piece of paper. It's affidavit. That's what he comes. Ma'am, what's your name? Capricia. What happens if uh, Bank of America called Denton County Sheriff and said, "Let's, uh, can you please evict Mr. Robinson?" What would happen? Well, they filed paperwork. Didn't they say, though, that they could yes. do because it wasn't a criminal matter, it was a civil matter? Yes, and that, that's the rub. The interesting part here is because he filed this paper, even though he is breaking the law, the law gives him some protection. What's the protection? He has to go through an ejection proceeding. What has to happen? A court has to determine, should this guy be kicked out? Right? I think you say this last semester with the landlord tenants, but... Nowadays, landlords can't just kick out their tenants willy-nilly. They need to go through an eviction proceeding. And what's the eviction proceeding? A court has to say, okay, is this person actually supposed to be kicked out? Has this person paid? Is this person behind on rent? And there are various procedures. So what this law does is it gives the benefit of the doubt to this squatter. Because uh, imagine, uh, man, what's your name? Yeah. Anna. So imagine a slightly different situation. Mr. Robinson's been living there for three years. Maybe Bank of America knew about it, but they called to tell the police, hey, this guy just moved in here last week. Go kick him out. 
cops don't know. It's like, okay, yeah, we'll go kick him out. The continuous three years, right? The continuous was just broken because he was he spent a, a week in jail, maybe. The reason why we have laws is so people don't get roughed up. So now a judge would say, well, he's actually been there three years. You can't kick him out. Or a judge could say, well, he's been there for you know a year and a half. Okay, you can kick him out, and that breaks his, his continuous. Okay. Now that that's an interesting question. Why do the neighbors care? Uh, who else lived in Dallas? And why why do you think the neighbors cared? Probably because they paid a lot for the house, and yeah. Yeah, the fairness thing is interesting. It's like, how did we pay? I guess these are like half a million dollar houses. Yeah, yeah we paid half a million dollars, and this dude's sitting there for sixteen dollars to file a court fee. So there's a fairness thing. Uh, but also, there's, there's probably other things like, you know, they don't want this guy in the neighborhood. They don't know where he's been. He's kind of just sitting there in an empty house. Um, the, it's actually a, a, a very common in a lot of communities for people to just move in there and squat. And they actually create hazards, right? He has no, no water, no, no, no power. So it actually ends up happening a lot of these places. People run these huge extension cords and these huge water pipes on the block. You might have seen these or read about these in the news. It's really not safe. Because um, you have these people running power cables right next to water lines, and it's just it's just a, a recipe. So that's a problem. But also, I think someone mentioned there that he's not contributing to the community. Um, there's probably the sense here that he's just kind of this outsider. Why is he here? He didn't. He's not coming here to raise a family. He's just literally sitting in his house. <coughs> and I think we'll we'll go into that kind of notion of keeping outsiders out. When we talk about land use and exclusion. Uh, property law is a tool of exclusion. It's able to keep people out, not just by conventional means, but by pricing things expensively. So that's something which we will, we will come back to later. But uh, thank you for the question. Um, let's see this. Uh, sir, what's your name? Dan? So you, you own a home or? OK. So say, let, let's use a different example. Say that, when did you buy your house? Uh, bought one. Uh, Okay, so let's just say you bought a house about five years ago, right? And you've been living in the house for five years. And you, you know you bought it. You thought you bought it from a reputable seller. You know, you, you're there. Your family's there. You know, you're living your life there. And then all of a sudden, some guy shows up and says, hey, your sale was no good. The person who sold it, you didn't actually have a proper title to it. It's my house. What are you going to say? Uh. You've been there. You've had you've had the house five years. Yeah. And this is a very different tenor of the Mr. Robinson argument because here there's just the guy just kind of squatting, but you actually bought it, you paid for it. So average possession isn't just a way to help the uh, the the, uh, the jerk, right? This is a way to protect all of our reasonable investments. If we buy something and we rely on it for a certain number of years, and we grow there, we family, we rely on it. We, that's where we expect to live. So it's not just about rewarding bad people. That's going to be the outlier case. Because more often than not, the Mr. Robbins in the world are going to be caught. Bank of America will find them very quickly. But this happens a lot in, for example, the, the Von Valkenberg case we'll do in a couple minutes, the Manilo case, where people were living on their land for a long time, and they didn't quite own it the right way. And they have to rely on this average possession law to save them. Um, just a broad overview. In this class, almost every single case you involve, in, I'm sorry, almost every case you study involves someone who does not own the piece of property they think they do. Either it wasn't sold properly, or they didn't buy it properly, or the person selling them didn't have it. Every single case we read involves someone selling something they don't have, or relying on property they don't have, whether you know they're building a, a staircase in someone else's land, or they're keeping a chicken coop on someone else's property. There's always going to be these disputes. The reason why cases are in that book is because someone messed up. Someone had a problem, and they had to go to a court. Okay? Um, I called you. Oh, so what's your name? Eddie. Eddie. Eduardo. Eduardo? Okay. What's, what's another reason why courts might want to set a specific time period for uh, for for these for the average possession. I'm sorry. What'd you say? Certainty. Certainty. Good. What do you mean by certainty? Predictability. You, I mean, 
don't just want the squatter to sit on his home to know that for three years mm -hmm. he's home free. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to look at this whole thing from a different perspective. I, I think this guy's doing this whole neighborhood of service. Yeah, it's, that's a good, it's a good point. Explain why. Um, well, I mean, I think if he had been able to stay there for the three years, right. and now he owns a home, the home's got an owner, he can either live in it the way normal people do, or the price is going to drive him out because somebody's going to offer him more money than him. $290,000, and now you've got somebody who's moved into the house, and, mm -hmm. you know, if you've ever lived next to a vacant home, yeah, it's scary. you complain to the homeowners association about the lawn not getting mowed, and they come back and the whole can't really do anything about it. Well, guess what? Water would be doing something about it. Have you lived next to a vacant home? Yeah, not complaining about it. Have you, has anyone else ever had that problem? Yeah? Uh, what would you do, sir? Oh, I didn't know. Oh, you raised your hand? Yeah. What, what happened when you live in your vacant home? I didn't find this to find out who it was. like a foreclosed house, maybe? Yeah. She should have made a vacation, you know, a, fat, a guest room or something, yeah? No, but but there is a valid point. I mean, these guys are kind of cultivating the land, and that's a term that's used in the Von Valkenburg case. Well, do we mean, um, you know, farming? Do we mean building walls? Do we mean mowing the laws? I mean, if someone's living there, it's not going to become like a, you know, a drug house. A lot of these foreclosed houses, uh, uh, drug addicts move in, they make it into a home. So there are there are some benefits. But, I, but the first point you made all, was also very good, certainty. Um, usually in the law, and I, you know, you probably say this, courts try and accomplish two goals, right? Fairness and efficiency. Th these are the, you know, two tugging things that will tug at you the entire semester. You try and do things efficiently, right? Well, from a perspective of efficiency, it's very bad to have this house sitting empty for three years. Okay, so we'll say if you are sitting in this house for three years, it's yours. That's your reward. But then there's a fairness. How is it that Bank of America or or someone else paid three hundred thousand dollars for the house, and this guy walks through with the fifteen dollars? So these are the kind of different things that we have to consider. Okay. Now, uh, sir, what's your name? Thank you. Jared. Which do you think is a stronger interest? That average possession tries to reward the jerk, Mr. Robinson, for just squatting, or are they trying to punish the property owner, Bank of America? What, what do you think is the stronger rationale behind this law? I think probably, probably punishing the property owner for leaving vacant. Why? If, if you're if you have those kind of punishments in place, then people aren't going to leave their house vacant, and it's going to they're going to stay there. They're going to clean up their yard. There, and then people won't squat in their houses. Yeah, you know, they won't. Have, mm -hmm. uh, Good. So, what's your name? Jeffrey. Jeffrey. What do courts like property to do? What generally, and this is from last semester. What do people like property to do? What what's like a strong value that we want property to do. And we want it to be useful. Yes, to yes. We want property to be used. We don't like property sitting empty. This is a very um, aggressive tool to make sure that property is not wasted because it involves actually changing ownership. This is actually one of the most drastic remedies. But we want property to be used in an efficient manner. Okay? So let's actually go down the elements. Uh, can you sir, ma'am, what's your name? Catherine. Catherine, okay. Let's, let's, let's walk through the elements. I'll, I'll call on you for one of them. So what's the what's the first element we have for adverse possession? Entry. Entry. Okay, what does that mean? That's the easy one. Yeah, and and use the right word too. Entry is a very you know glamorous word. It's trespass. There was probably a padlock on that house. I'm sure there's there was something, or maybe he went through a window or a back door. But there was some house that he had no no claim in, and he entered it. He brought his little chair with him. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 he entered. This one's the easy one. Don't, don't forget this one. You can't, uh, you can't have adverse possession unless you actually physically enter. Okay? All right, the second element, um, so what's your name? Mm -hmm. Benjamin, what, what's, what's the second element we have for adverse possession? Uh, I think it's the third. What's, what's number two? Yeah. 
it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. What does that mean? Um, it means that the people went up that uh, the land owner would like to use yeah, I mean, remember, like, Notorious B.I.G. That's how you remember it. He's very open. Everyone knows about it. Sir, what's your name? Oh, oh Alec, yeah. Why, why is this an important requirement? Why is notoriety in the open so essential for this to work? Just to make sure that it's to distinguish it from trespassing and things like that. Well, in, in the case of Mr. Robinson, the video we watched, was it open and notorious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, dude was on TV. This was, you can't get more open and notorious. And then what happens after he went on TV? Why? They found out. Exactly. So what's your name? John, why is this notoriety, this open requirement, so important? Yes. Yes. The law requires that you give the opportunity to the bank or the owner to find out so they can evict you. This isn't about, like, being all quiet and secret, right? Here, I'm going to go squat in this house for three years. I'm going to pull down the shades. I'm not going to say a word to anyone. Because then the bank will never know and they won't have an opportunity to evict you. Can you imagine that would be unfair? The guy is sitting in the basement for three years. No one knows he's there. Use your imagination, right? Sitting in the basement for three years. No one knows he's there. And then on year three, day one, he goes to court, and Bank of America says, hey, I never knew you were there. It's like, oh, no, I was here. I was just being quiet. No good. You have to be notorious. You have to be open about it, okay? Sir, what's your name? Yeah. Kenneth? Okay, what's, what's the third element we have here? Oh, what's the other what? No, it's the other one. How long did Robinson say he has to be there for? So what, what's the requirement here? Yes, that's a continuous. Why is why is continuity so important? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, so what's your name? Nick? Nick. So does this mean that Mr. Robinson has to stay in the house for three years? He can't go outside for fresh air? He can't, you know, go shopping? He, he can't go anywhere? No, he can go uh, to work. Stay he can go to work. Is that continuous still? The law says it. Why? He needs to be able to do things to want to do What does it mean for something to be continuous then? Does it actually mean literally th three years straight that moving out of the house? Right. Yeah. So, so what's your name? Jacob. What's the um? What's like the standard we would use to say whether it actually is continuous or not? How would we, you know, I'll borrow an example from the from the uh, class we do next time. There's a summer home, right? It's in the mountains, and you know, ten months out of the year, you can't get there because there's so much snow. So the guy squats for two months of the year. Would that be continuous? No, because the people were, I guess, it's the intent maybe to go back. They were not intending to stay away from it or the owner, the true owner. Well, the true owner is not there for those two months of the year either. <coughs> so what's your name? Joe. Joe, what do you think? There's a summer home in the mountains. Ten months of the year you can't get there because of snow. And... The first day the snow clears up, guy squats there and he's there for the entire summer. He does this every year for three years. Would that be continuous? Yeah, that's the, the way the property is normally used. Exactly. And that's the test. It's how is it, you know, how is it normally used? If this is a place that a house in a neighborhood, it's expected that a person will leave the house to go shopping, go to work, do whatever. Right? It's a summer home, and 10 months of the year, you can't get there because there's too much snow. Then, two months of the year, we'll cut it. Okay. The fourth one. Um, so what's your name? Robert, what's what's the fourth one? Okay. 
this is the trickiest one, and I'm going to only briefly define it here because the two cases that we study will help flesh out what this means. Basically, it has to do with hostility. Did you mean to take this land? Did you have some sort of claim to it? For example, Mr. Robinson had you know, this, this form, this, this affidavit of adverse possession. Yeah? And let's just read a little bit of it. Um, oops. I zoom out. Too big. So it says, uh, I, whatever, my name, describes a piece of land, the address. Okay, it says, uh, I swear and affirm that I have continuously and adversely possessed the uh, property since July 2011. Um... My claim is based upon my actual visual appropriation, possession of the mentioned property, hereby being open and notorious, peaceably possessing it due to abandonment. Uh, I intend to continue to enjoy and make further improvements. This is my personal dwelling. I will pay homeowners fees. Okay? So, this is his claim. He's saying, listen, this house is abandoned. I'm going to live there. Now, you might think, that's not a claim. That's not valid. Suspend your disbelief. We're in adverse possession land. You can have totally stupid reasons for why you're claiming it, and it probably is good enough. Now, you can say, you know, I don't like him, and he's not here, so I'm going to take it from him. Or you might say, well, you know, I didn't really know who owned it, but it was a nice house, and I want to live here. Or you might say, uh, it was abandoned, and, you know, whatever. There are different standards we're talking about in a few minutes. But this topic of uh, uh, claim of right broadly just means you have some broad claim to the land. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll drill down that in a few minutes. So these are the four elements. And I think this might be one of the only four-factor tests that give you the entire semester. There are very few things with elements, so enjoy these. These are, these are easy. Uh, I think maybe one or two things have four factors. Any questions? So far. Yes, yes, sir, right there in green. What's your name? Uh, Craig. Craig. Does filing that affidavit make it openly notorious? Does that put the people on notice? Like, would you have to go on news to make it openly notorious? Yeah, so the filing of this document does a couple things. One of which is the public record. Um, and this would probably be sufficient to tell the world that you are now living in it. Uh, but it also does something else, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, actually, do you remember what a color of title is? Do you remember that phrase? Color of title. Uh, it's further ahead in the notes. Anyone remember what that is? <coughs> yeah, exactly. So, generally speaking, when you bought a house, when you bought a house, they gave you a deed, they gave you a title, you know. And you think, oh, this is a good title, right? I got this. I'm living here with my family. And then five years later, someone comes along and says, hey, that's a bad title. Maybe there was a signature missing, or maybe the uh, court didn't approve it, or maybe the person selling it to you didn't have it. But you say, oh, but I have this piece of paper. And he says, well, your piece of paper is worthless. It's not a worthless piece of paper. When you're living somewhere based on some sort of document, even the document's no good, it gives you additional validity. So as far as Mr. Robinson was concerned, this document was his ticket. This was his golden ticket. Now, you might think, there's nothing here. It just says he's squatting. It doesn't matter. And I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit. But in Texas, uh, where is it? Okay. These are actually the Texas adverse possession statutes. Um, they're kind of hard to read. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Actually, that's much easier to read. Okay. Uh, okay. So this this is this is straight from the Texas Code. Um, it's linked on, on the page. So there are three different limitations in Texas. There are three different limitation periods. There's a three year. There's a five year. And there's a 10-year. 
Okay. The biggest difference between the three year, the five year, and the ten year has to do with how what kind of color of title you have. I'm sorry, what your claim of right is. So let's look at this one. Let's look at the three year first. It says a person must bring suit to recover real property held by another in peaceful and adverse possession under title or color of title, not later than three years. So what does that mean? If this guy is living in his house and he has a deed that he thinks is legitimate, turns out the deed's no good, but he's living there for three years, the three-year limit applies. When you have some sort of title or color of title, color just means like fake. A fake title, three years applies. Okay? Okay, let's turn to the five year one. The five year one's a little bit tougher. You might not have a color of title, but you have a registered deed. And we'll talk about the difference between deeds and titles later. Don't worry about that now. But this is less proof of purchase. Because if you have a color of title, that's legitimate. You, have, you, you think you have it. If you only have a, a deed that turns out to be no good, you have the five-year period. Okay. Now we turn to the 10-year period. This is what's usually called a catch-all. <laughs> this is the one that applies if the other two don't apply. So, person must bring suit not later than 10 years, right, to recover property held in peaceful and adverse possession by another, what does it say, who cultivates, uses, or enjoys a property. You don't have to have any paper, you don't need any documents, all you have to do is just cultivate it, use it, and enjoy it, and whether that means paying taxes or farming or I don't know what, you have to do something to it. Yes, sir? So, when we talk about, like, title and color of title... We're talking about the adverse possessor having it, not the yes. owner. Yes. Right. Well, the owner obviously has it. If the owner didn't have it, how can you sue to eject them? Well, I was thinking if the owner had, like, a color of title and his title was bad. Ah, okay. We'll do that next class, okay? <laughs> that's actually... That's this. That's section 23. That's when one person squats after another person. And we'll do that on Thursday, just so hang, hang tight. Um, but generally speaking, don't worry about the five year. It's usually three of the ten that, that really matters. If you have some sort of paper saying that you have this, it's three years. If you have nothing, if you're just a plain out squatter, ten years. Now, where was I up to? Uh, I, I, no. You? Yeah. Yes, what's your name? Wilson. Wilson. Why would the uh, Texas legislature, in infinite wisdom, separate these two? Why would they make it three years with color of title? And a decade with that. What, what's the what's the reasoning behind that? Well, think why. Wh which one's easier to get? Three years. And what do you need to get to three years? <laughs> More than patience. What else would you need to get to three years? What would you need? To, why is Texas rewarding those people three years, but everyone else a decade? Yes. Right. This is supposed to make it easier for people who are playing by the rules. Okay. Try not to think of Mr. Robinson as the as you know the uh, uh, the, the, the 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 standard case. The standard case is you're living in a house for a, a while and it turns out the person who sold it to you was a crook and didn't actually have it. But you've been living there long enough that you've built your family there, you've cultivated, you've used it, and you you thought you bought it, you paid for it. So the governments tend to try to reward with a three-year limit. People have taken the right steps. And then for the jerks who just squat there, go wait a decade. Try and wait a decade without the original owner finding out and see if you don't get kicked out. Okay? Yes, sir, in the back? Yeah. Yeah, and I don't even think it'd be, it would be good. He kept saying three years. I'm... So I'm pretty sure that this would not be enough to give him three years. Um, he seemed to think so. He actually went and gave a guest lecture at SMU Law School. I don't know why. I, whatever. But uh, 
he was actually giving a lecture in the community of how to do this. And this is actually the guy's name, uh, Andrew James Lefauer. He was actually a disciple <laughs> of Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson, I think, actually sold an e-book or, or some sort of an online book to try and tell people how to do this. And all these people started doing this. And in the Denton County Court, <laughs> all these people started following these affidavits to these foreclosed houses. And I think they just got all kicked out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think all this does, in my opinion, is it starts the clock. It makes it clear that the three-year or the ten, really the, the ten-year clock started ticking on this date, and this satisfied the open and notorious requirement. Tell one, yes, ma'am. Yes, it, it adds. A, I mean, it's not a very strong protection. This would prevent the cops from kicking you out right away, but he got kicked out pretty quick, sir. Um. The, um, title, you're gonna, that's actual public record. I mean, this guy, if he would have not, obviously been seeking a little bit of media attention, but he, <laughs> had he acted like every suburban household, no one would have ever questioned him. No one would have ever said anything unless, I mean, you don't have to see her for sale time to know that the house went for sale. So, no one would have ever questioned him, and so... You think you could have skated by if you stayed quiet? I mean, I think you're he would have right? acted like everybody else. I mean, I think he would have, for at least longer than what had Couple, happened. Yeah. Question here somewhere, so I hand. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just uh, in line with that. Uh, so he's not actually required to find the owner and tell them. So the the notoriety requirement is interesting. So today we live in an age where all these uh, uh, towns have records, right? Most most county courthouses have records. Think going back to jolly old England where there were no records, right? You had to tell. I mean, you might not have had to tell the person, but you had to be open on the land doing something with it. So had had the owner walk by. They would have seen you doing something to it. And in line with that, uh, if he was sneaking in the back way and hiding in the house, that wouldn't do it. You'd no. have to do like normal coming and going. Yeah. The, the, the trick is all reasonableness. Is he using the land in the manner in which a reasonable person in that neighborhood would use it? And if he's hiding in the basement, you know, <laughs> with the explicit intent of no one finding out, I don't think he could claim it. Yes, sir. I have a question on the continuous element. Mm -hmm. So if I went and squatted in a parking garage, and I made it open and notorious and did everything, but I didn't have a car, so I'm not using it in the way that it's supposed to be normally used. Okay, that's that's not. Does that mean that I don't need to continue. That's actually a very good question. So, and this is a good seg to the next case, the Van Valkenburg case. Very often, when we're talking about average possession, we're not talking about acquiring the entire property. We're talking about acquiring a right of way. What do I mean by that? So in this case, I promise I'll answer your question. There was a tall hill here and the main road here. Rather than walking around this tall hill, he walked across the land, right? That's what's called a uh, prescriptive easement. It's, it's a funny word. Prescriptive easement, which basically means that he's trying to acquire a right of way walking up. So to use your example, say a person every day for 10 years walked across a path, right? He's not claiming ownership of the path. He's only claiming the right to walk across it. He actually gets adverse possession. He gets a prescriptive easement to walk across the land. But now, instead of walking, he drives. Can he do that? I would say probably not. I mean, it kind of depends, but I would say probably not. Why? Uh, I mean, I would say it depends on what the land is, if it's grass or whether it's concrete. How did he cross the land for a decade? Walking. And what kind of right did he acquire? So, uh, so walking. Right. Yeah. He acquired the right to walk, nothing more. So it actually does matter. Uh, matter. The, the way in which you seize the property dictates what you get. Okay. There's a one other hand somewhere. All right. Let's talk about the Von Valkenburg case then. This is kind of... <laughs> You know, property disputes are kind of funny because people really, really hate each other. And in case you can tell, these families hate each other. I mean, the one guy was chasing the uh, kids with, with, a, with an iron pipe. And then <laughs> these cases are fun because they're crazy facts. So um, I think this picture will help make things a little bit easier. So you have the Luxes, and they move into this lot, 14 and 15, in the 1920s, and they build a house. And they built a house for their brother, Charlie, right over here. There's this adjoining kind of triangular-shaped plot 
which is just lots 19 through 22. Okay? Over the years, the Lutzes put stuff here. They put a chicken coop. They put a you know, garden. They put all these different things. Okay? And they also walk across this land. And the reason why is because there's some sort of a steep hill over here. So it's a lot easier to just cross over and walk up and walk all the way around. Okay? Uh, where was I up to? Uh, Amanda, what's your name? Amanda. Amanda? Who owned in the 1920s? Who owned lots 19 through 22 initially? Um, well, I'm not sure, but, um, but the other people did it. Just Van Balkenberg or VV, whatever makes it easier for you. <laughs> right. They didn't know they so much. Right. So they've been here since the 1920s using this land, uh, farming their chickens, whatever, right? 1937, the VV is moving, Van Balkenbergs, and they buy the land. At that point, when the von Valkenbergs purchased lots 19 through 22, who did they buy it from? Uh, what's your name? I'm sorry. Yeah, Ashley. Thank you. Who did who did the von Valkenbergs buy the land from in 1937? Yeah, they bought, they purchased it from the city, right? So usually, when a piece of property goes into foreclosure, whatever, it goes back to the city. Property Eshiot, if you remember that term from last year, usually goes back to the government. Okay? Based on what we learned before, assuming we have a 10-year uh, uh, average possession period, um, actually, actually, right? Okay. Did the city own that land in 1920, in 1937? <laughs> Yeah. So forgetting what the opinion is, the opinion's wrong. I mean, I think you, you probably all agree the majority opinion is not right. It can't be right. But based on what we learned, they've been using that land for all these years, right? It wasn't the cities to sell. The Lutzes acquired it through average possession. That, that's the right answer. But that's not what happened. So the litigation is kind of funny. Ma'am in the back, what's your name? Stephanie. So why did the court, I'll put it this way, in their initial lawsuit, there were two rounds of litigation. In their initial lawsuit, what did the Lutz's lawyer do that was really stupid? Right, okay. So in the first round of litigation, the Lutz's lawyer is an idiot. Okay? There was definitely a malpractice claim to be had. The Lutz's lawyer says, okay, we're going to concede that the Von Valkenbergs own this land. Right, yeah, face palm. It, 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 totally wrong. All he was seeking in the first case was the ability to cross over this prescriptive easement I mentioned before. We'll, we'll do that a little bit later. It's unclear why he said that. But because he said that, <laughs> the court effectively ruled that the Von Valkenbergs own the land. Now, what's your name? What's that? PJ? How did the court, though, putting aside the lawyer's idiocy, how did the court rationalize the fact that they've been on this land for all these years, they've been raising chickens, and they had a garden, and they had a coop? What, what did the majority opinion do with all those facts? The majority? Mm -hmm. So what, what was he doing? Just like making garbage? I mean, yeah. So again, the majority is certainly wrong. But the reason why they're wrong is interesting. So the first rationale is like, listen, this New York law requires to cultivate the land. That's what the law says. And oh, they had trash, and they had whatever, chickens. It's not cultivation. That's, that's wrong. But they made another point that I think is worth focusing on. Um, what's your name? Sam? What do we make of the fact that the lawyer conceded, dumb, 
conceded that, yeah, my client didn't own the land. Was that even a valid concession to make? Yeah. So let me ask you a question, right? Uh, do you own a house? Do you own a property? Assume you do, right? So assume you own a piece of property. You tell me, you know what, Josh, I don't own it. Can I move in? You just said you don't own it. Uh, and what's your name? Lucy. What's the only way to get rid of a piece of property? Is making a, a, dis a disclaimer in court saying you don't own it enough? What do you have to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sell it, give it away. If the if the Lutz has owned this piece of property in the 1920s, right, after 10 years, does the mere act of a lawyer saying they don't own it get rid of it? No. You can't will property away. You can't really say, oh, yeah, it's not mine anymore. Even if this idiot lawyer made this, this, this stupid concession in, in, the, uh, in the court, that's not enough to negate the property right. The Lutz has had it free and clear. Even though the lawyer said that, they can't get rid of it. And, and it wouldn't make sense, though. right? You can't get rid of property by saying it. If I say, nope, I don't own my house anymore, that's not enough. So, sir, what's your name? John. John. What about the fact that um, the Lutzes said something like, oh, we don't know who owned it. We, we didn't know who owned it. Does that matter? Or we didn't know that we were squatting on it. We didn't know someone else owned it. Does that matter? Yeah, as far as like being notorious. Is it the notorious requirement, or is it another requirement? Um, it, it, it's one of the requirements, but it's not notorious. Yes, and which, which, which of the elements does that fall under? Um, There's only four. <laughs> Here, I'll go back. Which which one of these four? Right there. Um, I mean, I guess it's entry. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> Keep going down. You'll get there. You'll get there soon. No. Yes. Yes. Good. It goes to adversity. Dude, I should just kept going. Let you keep going. Yes. So it goes to adversity, right? He didn't know he was squatting. As far as he was concerned, he was just on the land. This is the exact opposite of Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson says, yeah, I know I'm squatting from this, that, whatever. Is it required, so what's your name? Jason. Jason, is it required for the person to actually know that they're squatting in someone else's land? Well, depending on the next case, uh, they're supposed to be hostile to the Okay, so this is an issue. You're right. This is an issue that's split. Some jurisdictions require hostility. Some don't. So here's like the Texas one. Let me go back to it. It just says. Uh, held in peaceable and adverse possession by another. So this doesn't have this hostility requirement, right? Some states say, or at least the common law says, has to be hostile. The more modern trend, and surprisingly Texas is in the modern trend, the more modern trend is you don't need hostility. Why? Um, sir, uh, what's your name? Was it? Bakunda, why, why is hostility a bad requirement? Why would we not want that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so here are really there are three, the book talks about three different states of mind. And the state of mind goes to the fourth element of claim of right. Okay? So, um, in the green shirt, what's your name? Matt? What's what's one of the states of mind the book talks about? It, it, it's uh, in, the, in the notes somewhere, which you should probably all read. I'll tell you when you have to skim notes, but if, if it's not skim, you should read them.
Okay, in the back row. What's your name? Monica. What's? Do you know? You have it. All right. Pink shirt. Name? Aiden. Do you know the uh, states of mind? New York is not one of them. All right. Redeem yourself. Objective. What does that mean? Uh, no, that's a good faith. <laughs> All right. Uh, who wants to help you out? Who's got him? All right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. So this would be the dissent in the von Valkenburg case. This is basically saying we don't care what was in the mind of the squatter, right? Mr. Lutz was on this land. He was farming his chickens. He wasn't really thinking about adverse possession. Um, I mean, before this class, none of you ever even heard of adverse possession. So it's kind of unfair to have to uh, require people to have this kind of intent of squatting. It's enough saying, listen, he was there. He was using it. Whatever. Save mine doesn't matter. Okay? Uh, what's your name in the blue? Jonathan, you know the, the second state of mind? You know? Yeah, what, what's your name? Jared. Jared. Okay, they, they thought they owned it. This is this is what we call a good faith. What what do you mean by that? They thought they owned it. Good. You must have a good faith that you, you bought it. So this is my friend over here who, who, who bought a house. He thought he bought it. He thought he paid for it. He got all the paperwork done, and the paperwork was bad. So this is saying, listen, even if you, you have to think you know it. So this is a little bit tougher. The first one would benefit Mr. Lutz. The second one wouldn't, because here it requires you have to think you own it. And the third requirement in the back with the suit, what's your name? Blue water bottle. Yes, what's your name? It's okay. Matt, what's the third state of mind requirement? It's aggressive Yes, so aggressive trespasser. And this basically means you're a jerk, right? This is Mr. Robinson. I don't own it, but I want to make it mine. This is the toughest standard because this requires not only that you're there, but you have to say, I don't own it, but I will. You're basically admitting the fact that it's not yours. Okay? And these and these state of and these standards kind of go back and forth. Uh, among the different states. The modern trend is to go to either one or two, either objective or some sort of good faith. Um, as the aftermath of the Von Valkenburg case, New York imposed a good faith standard, which is, listen, under the good faith, we're not going to reward the jerks like Mr. Robinson, but we will reward people who thought they owned their homes, but they didn't, which is kind of like a middle ground. Okay? All right. Any questions about that? Okay, let's do the last case from today. Um, I always shrug to ask, but do I have any of my uh, anyone from New Jersey in this class? Oh, okay, I, I'm from Staten Island. I am a total carpetbagger, uh, but I am here. So um, the last case. Ah, so who has the burden to prove the state of mind? The, the question over here. Usually, it's up to the um, person asserting adverse possession. Okay, so, so the way this works is Mr. Robbins is there, right? He's in court. I'm sorry, he's in the house. Bank of America moves to eject him. What's in Mr. Robinson doing in response? Uh, Ma'am, what's your name? Colin. So Bank of America says, Ms. Robinson, we move to eject you. What's Robinson going to say in response? Yes, he's going to raise a defense, right? Adverse possession, more often than not, is raised as a defense. You're getting kicked out of your house. You're going to raise your defense saying, uh-uh, I, I, I've squatted here enough. And in that adverse possession, you have the burden of showing that you've been there for three years. You have to show you entered, that it was continuous, that you had uh, uh, open notorious, and that there was a claim of right. So you have to show it. Um, Bank of America can say, well, maybe your state of mind wasn't correct, but the burden is on the squatter to prove it. The burden is not on the other person. There are other cases where we'll talk about being flipped, but here are the burdens on the uh, squatter. Okay, we'll go with that. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, David. All right, so the last case is a Manila versus Gorski case. And this is something that can happen to anyone. Um, if anyone's ever done home, uh, home construction, right? Uh, my parents recently had a situation where their, uh, their, their neighbor was yelling at them that there's some tree that overhanged and was dropping leaves. And my dad was like, well, where's the boundary? I'm like, I don't know. And he said, here's this blueprint, you know, the, the schematics. I'm trying to read and I can't figure it out. But I have no idea. Go hire a survey. It's often really tough to figure out where one property begins and one one property ends. So here we had these people who were building some sort of a house. Uh, they, they raised it. Um, I'm guessing they raised it because of the flooding, actually. Keensburg, where this happened, is very close to this Jersey Shore, which, as you know, was just flooded by Sandy a couple years ago. This was last year. Um, they raised it, and as a result of raising it, the uh, steps crossed over by about 15 inches. Yep. So, sir, in the blue, did they know that it was crossing over by 15 inches? No. Yeah. What's the only way for them to have figured out that they were crossing over to the other guy's land? Yeah. Yeah, everyone knows what a survey is? A survey is basically an expert who comes out with the measurements and figures out where all the meets and bounds are. Um, short of actually doing the survey, there's no way of knowing. So let's look at this case in terms of the four elements, right? So... Uh, let's jump back there. Sir, what's your name? Florin. Florin? Florin. Florin, okay. Was there entry? Yes. Why? Yeah, yeah, there, there was an encroachment, okay? Let's come back to the uh, other element. Uh, what's your name, sir? Bazaar. Was it continuous? Okay. Uh, Ma'am, what's your name? Kim? Was it continuous? Yes, yes, it was continuous for whatever number of years. So, oh, page break. If I ever forget to scroll, tell me, okay? So, the other two, though, are tougher. So, let's first talk about hostility. I'm um, sorry, what's your name? Marco. Marco. Well, that's actually for your claim of right. Was there a claim of right in this case? Okay, so we know there was no hostility because they didn't even know what they were doing it, right? Mm -hmm. What's the what's of these three state of minds we studied here? Under what state of mind do they win? Why? Or they'd also win under. They lose here under the aggressive trespasser. Why? They lack the hostility. So a lot of the discussion in this case is going back and forth about what's the correct standard to apply. They, they cite this old main case, uh, the, the Preble case, um, that said it can't be premised on a mistake, that we need to only reward the hostile people. <laughs> Does it make mis uh, uh What's your name, sir, in the white? Was it Ronnie? Ronnie. Ronnie. Why would we reward the jerk, but not the person that they had in good faith? What, what sense does that make? Yeah. Yeah, the common law always required this hostility because they didn't want to reward mistakes. They don't like rewarding mistakes. They want something easy, right? What's easy? The easy thing is Mr. Robinson sitting there for three years. Everyone knows it. What's hard? Well, these people lived here, and they were walking up and down the stairs, and the stairs were like, you know, maybe a foot and a half over. That's a harder proof to make. Courts like things that are simple. So, sir, in the, what's your name? David. David. What do the courts, what does this court do with the, uh, the, uh, the fourth element? Do they stick with the uh, main doctrine, or do they move somewhere else? No idea? Okay. Try for next time. Uh, did I back row right there? What what does the what does the Jersey court do with this old main doctrine? Uh, 
I'll get there in a second. No, I'm talking about the hostility requirement. Do they stick with that main aggressive trespasser doctrine, or do they move to another doctrine? What, what's that doctrine? <laughs> and what does the Connecticut doctrine say? Help her out. So what's your name? Mom, it was the Connecticut doctrine say? Yes. In other words, the state of mind doesn't matter. They move. Okay? So that's how they resolve the fourth one. But, so what's your name? Ian. Ian, what? The open notorious one. How did they resolve that one? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because think about it. The only way Mr. Robinson gets the land is if Bank of America knows about it, right? How can these people possibly move to evict this staircase if they don't know it's on their land? And the only way to know is with a survey. So was it open and notorious? Well, what's the answer? Yeah. Well, actually, it wasn't a trick question, because if you don't know, it's not open and notorious. Open and notorious means it's open and everyone knows about it. If it's you know unclear, it's not open and notorious. Okay. Any questions on that case? Yes, in the back. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's. Did they? You know. I I guess it's actually objective and subjective. It's, did they know or should they be on? Should they have been on notice? Would would a reasonable person have figured this out? So if you file a document in the court. That's something to put a reasonable person on notice. If you have a guy sitting there on the 6 o'clock news, that's something to put you on notice. If there's a 15-inch encroachment that no one knows, it's probably not. Okay? All right, so just to kind of summarize, uh, today we talked about the, the, these four elements of adverse possession. Okay? This is probably the easiest part of the class you've learned one thing. There are these four elements and state of mind. In the next class, Pull up the syllabus. In the next class, we'll talk about actually how you take land. Um, it gets trickier when, alluding to a question I asked before, when one person squats and then sells to someone else. And what happens when you combine, or the word is tacking, these two different claims together? Uh, so there, there are two cases to study um, which, which give you a, a nice overview of uh, how uh, this doctrine works. Any questions? All right, please take the cookies, bring them home. I don't want to see them. I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.